There I did. I did it again. I forgot to record. Um, a heretic is someone who has a different belief or opinion. I believe that the appraisal theory that most of you have learned in school is so outdated, so wrong. It's got very little relevance to the year 2021. And with that said, we have to go back to the basics of, 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 of appraisal, which goes back thousands of years to probably, you know, Samaria and Ur and Babylon, where somebody held up a, a set of scales. And on one side, you put the goods and the other side, you measured it with um, uh, weights of gold or whatever was the commodity at that time. And that's the basics of appraisal Th thousands of years later. And I'm like, really, really? Because although there were, there were some great books on economics in um, the 19th century, in the 1880s, um, the real Bible of appraisal is a book by Frederick Bab Babcock. Babcock's theory in 1924, 1924 is the basis of all modern appraisal. It is a brilliant book, but it's 1924. And what happens is um, appraisal has not gotten away from that. I have a very vast library um, of real estate books. As a former appraiser, I have a good section on appraisal. A lot of the textbooks are talking about $5,000 adjustments and $7,000 adjustments. We're into million, two, three million dollar properties today, like nothing, no matter where you are. And how do you adjust $5,000? So the concept of the adjustment theory, I say, is archaic in many ways, because this is what we still have. We are looking at this balance sheet. If you go back, those of you that ever took appraisal through ARIA or any appraisal institute or whatever, the idea is that your house, the subject, it's everything is compared to the subject property. The subject property is the one that you're compared to. And therefore, if it doesn't have a basement, um, a finished basement, then you take away dollars and the scale goes up. And then you have to adjust and add dollars to allow for that. Everything is in a balance. Well, it works in theory, but not, it's not practical. And it's not practical because the events of the last years have thrown this right out the window. We're not dealing, buyers aren't acting this way, sellers aren't acting this way, and we as agents are sitting there like deer in the headlight we don't even have a clue what a property's going to sell for. We have a guess, but that's it. Um, my record is a simple one. Um, a few years ago, when we were going crazy again with multiples, I did 21 offers before I got uh, my first deal. After 21, um, I lost 21 times to finally win. It's frustrating. And I'll tell you that, it's really frustrating. I'll tell you a little about me, those of you that don't know me. I'm 53 years in real estate. Um, it's the only industry I've known in my adult life. I've never had a paycheck. I'm not going to go through all this, um, except to say that when I speak, I don't speak about somebody who did the business 10, 15 years ago. I did this business as of yesterday. I'm in the trenches. I'm a very busy Remax realtor. I'm at Remax Ultimate. I had my own brokerage till about eight years ago. I was a broker of record. I closed um, to basically, um, I've said this to many brokers, any of the brokers or managers listening right now. One of the reasons I went to my brokerage, besides I actually really care about my broker, is that I was asked. No one else could ever ask me. And um, I thought that was kind of interesting. So um, my appraisal background. Appraisal background, I was a member of the Appraisal Institute for 30 years. I went to university, I took my courses, I got a CRA designation. I was supposed to get my AACI, but for my own reasons, I didn't. I had my own reasons. Um, I was um, designated by the Canadian National Association of, of Real Estate Appraisers with a uh, commercial designation for 12 years. I was on their board. Um, currently, and I've stayed, I'm an independent fee appraiser senior 
which allows me to praise both residential and commercial anywhere in North America. Um, I was many times the spokesperson on television media for the Appraisal Institute. I had a very good relationship. I have a lot of respect for the Appraisal Institute of Canada. And um, um, I was a proud member, but uh, when I sold my firm, my appraisal firm of 11 years ago, um, I had a non-competition clause and um, there was no sense paying the very expensive dues and errors and emissions. So I gave up my designation there. Um, Lebo Hicks, which is the firm I founded, was Lebo Appraisal. Lois Hicks now runs it, was founded in 1974. At our peak, we had 13 residential appraisers and um, eight commercial appraisers. We were doing about four to 5,000 houses a year, and I was supervising when I wasn't working on commercial myself. And where is this coming from? I have viewed thousands into the tens of thousands of appraisals to work for me every, I was going to put a sign up over my door, Lebo's home for failed realtors, because I had a policy, you couldn't work for me unless you had been a realtor. I don't care if you were the worst realtor ever, because as much as it's a, there's science to it, you have to have the feel for value. Value has to be felt. There's an art to uh, uh, dealing with the value. So the appraisers would come to me with all this stuff. And finally, I got so frustrated that I started to make a mandatory thing that changed the way we did business and the way the appraisers looked at things. They came to me with traditional, this is what's sold, this is what's sold, this is what's sold. And I kept saying to them, well, that's wonderful. What's on the market? What, how, what's your market absorption? How many properties are on the market? What are you competing with? And how could your value be 775 if there's another house right now similar to this on the market at 695? How could you be 775? There's two on the market under that. Look at current comparable sales. And listings had to become part of the appraisal process. As a matter of fact, um, when I go out to do a CMA for a client, I never start with what's sold. I only start with the first things that are on the market. What is on the market now? And that is huge to me. The next thing that I go to is the sales. I also am going to get into the expired in a minute. Okay. So here's, here's now some of this is right out of my listing presentation. Okay. This is an enlisting. I'll, I'll give you some stuff as I get to my own listing presentation. I will actually mention it. Here's four opinions of value. The seller wants the highest value possible. The buyer wants the lowest value possible. So we have two opinions of value on the same house. And I'm going to be focused only on a house on this um, short seminar. The agent and the appraiser have to look at the bar of what is true market value. And um, they are using almost the same data, probably the same data. The agent has one advantage over the um, agent has an advantage over the appraiser. If the agent works a neighborhood well, the agent may have been inside the comparable properties and has inside information or their office may have sold it or whatever. The appraiser has more of a general feel. There are some appraisers that do go to open houses and do track. So I give them full marks. But in the bottom line, what we look at, true market value, you can throw all the definitions out. By the way, never, ever use the expression in real estate, fair market value, fair market value. And it is brought up, um, I do a lot of litigation work. It is a judge's job to decide what is fair. How can a buyer who's overpaid and a seller who thinks they gave it away, both have a fair market value. So how can it be fair? To be fair, it has to be the buyer got the greatest deal at the same time that the seller got the greatest deal. It doesn't make sense. Market value happens when the ceiling of the buyer meets the floor of the seller. Does that make sense? In other words, the market value transpires when the seller comes down enough 
and the buyer comes up enough. And ladies and gentlemen, we influence that because the other aspect of it is a good real estate negotiator. And you can use, I don't care if you're using DocuSign, I don't care if you're scanning, that does not take away face to face to face to face. Um, so you, you have to be able to negotiate a good offer. What is not in the adjustment process? We don't know the motivation of the sellers. Sometimes you do. You know they were being relocated and had to be in Calgary in two weeks. You, know, you may know that. But we don't know that we're looking at our comparable data. We don't know the motivation of the buyers. I've seen buyers overpay just to get their kids into a school. So have you. I've seen people and you've seen people overpay because mom and dad live around the corner and they can babysit. That's important to them. We don't know what commission rate. If my daughter will be looking for um, a condo soon, I am not charging my daughter. So if you look at that uh, uh, deal, I factored in. There's, there's uh, a my end, two and a half percent goes out the window. It's not factored in. Let me ask you a question. If somebody sells a house for a million dollars, do they walk away with one million dollars? No, they walk away anywhere from 950 net to, if it's a relative, maybe they do get a million dollars. But in most cases, there's a variable of 5% based on the what commission is charged from a mere poster, a 1% or a full price commission. There's so many variables. And the last is the quality of the realtor, the negotiation skills of a realtor. Now, I myself, one of my presentations in my presentation to my sellers, when I'm, I'm a listing agent more than a buyer's agent, I always tell people, I don't care about your transaction. I'm here for you. I am a relationship broker. I am going to negotiate. I'm going to get you the highest price possible. I am not here just to get the file off my desk. So it's very important to see what role you are. Are you a good negotiator? We have right now, now remember I've, um, I better move myself over a little bit here. Whoops, um, let's move this in place, get myself smaller. Okay, and I can't, come on Barry, move, 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 move. Oh God, I'm playing here, sorry folks. So what happens here is economists, when they look at real estate data, they don't understand something. Real estate is bought and sold by emotion. Yes, I know. There are families just had another baby. They need an extra bedroom. Yes, there are people that need to have a bigger house because they're moving mom and dad to live with them. That's, that's a percentage. I still say after 53 years in real estate, the majority of people buy the biggest house they can to impress their relatives, their friends, and themselves. We, pe two people or three don't need 4,000 square feet. What we have right now is a herd instinct. The public is acting like they did in, the, I've seen it in the 70s, in the 80s, and in the 90s. It was just going over a cliff. And there's a, um, a quote, um, in a Sherlock, oh boy, do I screw this up. There's a quote in a Sherlock Holmes book, basically paraphrased in a, uh, when everyone is acting crazy, the crazy person, um, the crazy individual, when sane people, that's it. When sane people are acting crazy, the crazy person appears sane. And that's almost what we've got here today. People are in a frenzy to buy. And the question becomes, are they right? Where is this going to end? Is it going to end? And my, my comment on that is, I don't care. I get my commission if it goes up, down, sideways, or backwards. I'm not an economist. And what economists never look at is what drives humans to buy and sell. And in most cases, not all, in most cases, it is about emotion. People act on crowd instinct. Okay, we good so far? Great. So let me just move myself again. Okay, I'm learning how to use this. This is great. 
There's something called the composition effect. You don't have to think about this. This is good. Basically, what this is, this is a graph showing how people are acting. Many years ago, I took a seminar. I, one of the first times I'd ever seen a Mac, it wasn't a Mac computer, it was an Apple computer. And what we did was we went to York University to study um, urban uh, geography, and we took a plastic sheet and we put dots on it. And every week we did more input of data, data, data. And every week we came back and we did this. And the exam basically was interpret all the input of all the data. And what we did was we saw the patterns of people and the projections of where real estate was going and what have you. And that of course I probably took, well, when did Apple come out before Mac? So it's probably 30 years ago. So this is the composition effect. And I'm not worried about that. How a buyer determines value. So when they bought their last house, how did they compare? They compared it to other houses. If they're the first time buyer, how did mom and dad buy their house? Well, the house down the street was selling for this much and this is this. They were, and they also are comparing now to what's on the market. The other thing is that's changed dramatically in real estate, which I'm not an advocate for, is that we gave the public access to MLS. We gave it away. We opened it up in the United States National Association of Realtors, started with realtor.com. We got realtor.ca. All of a sudden, the public has access. We were keepers of the gate. They know, they see, we're, I mean, people sit up all night. I mean, you know, you're getting text messages at two, three in the morning from clients. I saw this one. I saw that one. I mean, real estate porn is a reality. It is really a re I'm when you read therapists are dealing with someone say, doctor, I have a porn problem. I'm into real estate porn. The value of real estate is still determined by buyers through comparison shopping. So this is out of my listing presentation. And um, I started, as I said, 53 years ago, 1968, I saw a San Francisco newspaper that actually had an article this was in the training program I took. And it said that the first offer is your best offer. Do you know, 53 years later, that's not an unproven fact. And I tell people like this, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, as of right now, your house has been on the market for weeks, if not months. Well, we are, we're not ready to, we're listing next week. No, you don't understand. You know that there's been multiple offers, yes. Well, you know, the house down the street had 12 offers, yes. Only one person bought. 11 people are waiting for your house. Your house is, is not on the market. Your phantom house, they want your house. So when we get the first set of offers, the best offer there will be your best offer. It doesn't mean the offer, the, the offer price may be, the, it should be the offeree. By the time we finish negotiation, because if you don't sell right away, then what's going to happen, the house is going to get stale. And I'll show you the effects of that in a minute. Let me ask you, Mr. and Mrs. Price, let me tell you about the real estate market. Location is a given. Neither of us control that. Your location is fixed. It is what it is. The financing today, I don't control the mortgage market. Neither do you. It is what it is. Marketing, that is 100% on me. I control the marketing, and I'm going to explain to you what our marketing plan is. Condition, although I'll make suggestions about the condition, that is your control. And the depends on the condition of the house, that's going to manifest itself in the dollars you get or don't get at the end. The price listed. Now, I told you when I came in to sit down with you that there's two things we're going to discuss up front. First, we're going to discuss my commission before as I'm before I leave here. And two, you're going to help set the price on your house. You have control of that. I'll give you the, all the parameters, which by the way, those listening, you're going to say, this is part of what I do. I tell people they're going to set the price on their house. And I'll go through that in two minutes. And the price sold, I have nothing to do with that. That is the market. The market speaks. I have red dots. I went to Staples. I got these um, labels that you put through your printer. I got them in red. And on it in slant, it says the market speaks. 
That goes on all my uh, literature. It sits on the table in front of me. And when people come back and start challenging me, I point and I go, excuse me, the market speaks. Not me. The market speaks. I never lose sight of that phrase. Advantage is Mr. and Mrs. Price, a proper pricing. You get the faster sale. Less inconvenience. I've sold my own home more than once. I hate waking up every morning and the first thing I got to do is scrub the sinks, make sure the bathrooms are perfect, make the beds, make sure the place looks like homes and gardens, like they're going to do a photo shoot. I get tired of it and fresh flowers and everything. Also, the more agents, I tell everyone like this, the way I measure if your property is a properly priced house is by agent showings. If agents aren't coming through, because I have to sell your house, I have to sell your house multiple times. The first time I put your house out, the first sale I have to make is I have to sell it to realtors. I have to get the realtors to come to see this house. 35% of buyers come because they, their realtor found the house. The next group of people that I have to sell is the public, and that's the 65%. But the third is also important, the appraiser. Because if the appraiser, if people are going for financing and the appraiser can't see the value of your house, the people have trouble with a mortgage, they don't get up their financing, we don't close the deal. So I've sold it twice, but I can't sell it the th third time. Now, um, there's more money to you. You get, I get better response in advertising. It attracts easier financing when I go faster, higher offers, and it avoids the property from being shopworn, stale, on the market. There, you can almost say that a, a overpriced listing is a stigmatized listing. In a buyer's market, we know what that is. This is part of my listing presentation. Um, more sellers than buyers in a buyer's market. In a seller's market, there are more buyers than sellers. And that's where we are right now, 2021, speaking from a Toronto perspective, obviously. Now, benefits of moving. This is out of, I go through it all, no more open houses. Thank goodness. One thing about COVID, uh, by the way, as a complete personal aside, I do a lot of estate work. And the beautiful thing about estate work is when I sell estates, dead people don't ask for open houses. Um, I'm not a great lover of open houses, never have. It just gives, I go through this. This is one of my slides that I'm giving you. You can go to YouTube later and take it off. Nothing, now we get right into the, uh, the nut of this today. Let's look at this, you the realtor, nothing is comparable. It's over, it's gone. The days of true comparables are really um, difficult because not, appraisal theory pre is all predicated on you've got all these comparable, you've got three comparable sales and you can adjust them against yours. If only real life was like that. I'm sitting right now, I've got a property coming to market, ladies and gentlemen, with all my expertise, I'm guessing at what price to put it on the market. At the end, I'm guessing, but I'll show you how I guessed using some formula that I'm gonna be giving you. Not a crazy math that you have to learn, just a simple, simple way. Lose the term comparable because what you have is competitive. Now, what negates the comparable process? Well, I'll make it real simple. Let's go to Tribute Homes, Great Golf Homes, any of them. Somebody moves in and immediately they finish the basement. Right away, that's the first thing they do. They've changed it. Their house isn't comparable to the one next door. Or they didn't like the builder's quality of materials and they start upgrading the materials. Or they live like pigs and the place is trashed within 30 days or more. So you can't compare because things change. And with that, we look at the fact that if you are in a cookie cutter subdivision, and that includes the vertical subdivisions and the horizontal, the condominiums and everything else, you get lucky. You've got this. You don't need me here today. That's a simple appraisal. It's a very, that you can do the adjustment process for. The appraisers drive up 
Here's what happens when you're an appraiser. And it happened to me so many times. There must be appraiser or two listening to me right now. They'll, they'll, they'll smile when I say this. You're driving down the street and it's all bungalows and you see a peak of a two and a half story house uh, down the street and you're saying to yourself, no, no, no. And as you get closer, you realize that's the one you have to appraise. Somebody decided to come back to the old hood, tear down a bungalow and build some grand house and you've got that. Or um, like happened to me in Scarborough, I go out there and I'm driving, I'm going, as I sing it and down the street, I'm really going, please no. The city deemed the original farmhouse to be historical and the subdivision was built around an 1885 farmhouse. What was the subject property? The farmhouse. Like, come on. So you don't always get these cookie cutter appraisals. So here's some appraisal facts. No one can buy a sold house. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. If we were live right now, we'd be in an auditorium. I'd ask somebody and I'll, I'd pick somebody up. Agnes, I see you sitting there. So I'm going to pick you out right now. And just bear with me. I'm just using you as an example. Let us take, yes or no, do you have a, a deal closing soon? Okay. Are the people happy? Yes or no? Just yes or no? Okay. And I can't see your, your hand was an expensive. Okay, so let's take it was a million dollar house. Was it was it was in that range or not? Or yeah, okay. If I came to your buyer right now and I said, I'm gonna give them oh my god, how did I pick the right person here? Agnes, this is great. Um, if I came to your buyer right now and I said, here's one million dollars, walk away, would they walk away before closing? No. If I came to them and said, here's fifty thousand dollars to buy your offer. Would they walk for 50? Would they walk for 100? But I can't buy it at a million. That's what it all boils down to. How can we use sold sales of yesterday when today's price is today's pri is yesterday's price plus today's premium? It can't be done. So you also have to look at expiries. I love expired listings when you find them because if everything on the street is selling a million, a million one, a million two, and there's three listings and a million three fifty, a million four, and so, and they haven't sold, you throw these down. I have a red file with a big letter rejected on it. I put it on the table and I go, How could you ask more for yours when these sat in the market and reject? Oh, by the way, this one's been listed three times in the last year and a half. It, the public is rejecting it. The market speaks. So truthfully, the first thing you've got to look at are only thing that counts. We should be comparing value today on actual listings that are competing with yours. Make sense? Okay. You Here's a Tesla stock. Can I go back and buy Tesla three months ago? Well, then... How can I, but if an analyst, somebody is doing an analytical, if, how can they use Tesla's price of the stock at a, at a lower price when up today it's up here? Now, the difference is, yes, the stock market moves every day, all through the day, and you can gauge what's happening today. But in real estate, appraisers come along and do a snapshot in history and say that's today's market value. And that is why deals are being screwed up. And that is why we are having problems because you and I were taught in school, you have to look at these souls to predicate the, the present and the future. Real estate value today is a moving target. It is like nailing water to the wall. So prices are going up. Here's something you've got to look at. I put on, I have three binders. I, I do two presentations. One is my marketing and the next one is independent. I go through the pricing. I never start with pricing. Pricing is not part of my listing. Um, uh, I have something called my kick-ass listing presentation. It is not um, there and it's separate. And I have three binders, historic, rejected, and competition. 
The rejected is in big letters and the rejected is in a red file folder. It sits right in the desk and on every folder, it says the market speaks. Okay, next. Um, I want, I just put this in anytime I teach, I do this the same. Please understand if everyone here is in Ontario, you can do, there is no licensing in the province of Ontario to be a real estate appraiser. Every single one of us can do appraisals. Yes, as a realtor, you can appraise for an estate. Yes, you can appraise for a divorce, but you're foolish if you just do it for nothing because you'd be dragged into court. And what did you get? Just because you thought you were gonna get a listing? Don't waste your, I charge X dollars for an appraisal. If they come to me for a divorce or something, I let's say I charge them seven fifty, and I give them a um, a guarantee that if they make a real estate move, a buy or sell with me within eighteen months, it's refundable. It's that simple. But I don't do give my work away for free. You cannot do. Oh, pardon me. Yes, you can. You can do evaluation for mortgage or any kind of um, what you would call it pricing. Um, for financing, but errors and emissions will not cover you. You are not covered in the province of Ontario under errors and emissions for any valuation that a realtor does for mortgage financing. Okay, be very careful about that. All right, so why do appraisers make bad appraisals? First of all, the theory is outdated. They look behind to see ahead. They believe you, everybody can still buy a sold house. They don't look at what's on MLS. They don't look at the activity. Um, and and if, they're, if they're a sophisticated real, um, appraiser, they are doing relocation work, which is forecasting. Many of them have never sold real estate. And I think that's a problem. And also to be, when I was in a, what, I'll admit it. When I, I was with my dad one day, my dad was buying a property on the St. John's side road in Leslie, 53 acre property. And um, it was a really interesting deal. And he brought me up, I met him there and he said, well, what do you think, should I buy this? And I went, blah, 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 blah. And I started negating this thing. I went, and my father looked at me and he says, take that appraisal hat of yours and shove it in a certain part of my anatomy. He says, you're a realtor. I'm asking you as a realtor. I stopped dead. And I looked and looked and looked and I went, you know what? This is a pretty good deal. I'm, I was such a cynic as, as an appraiser, but as a realtor, I'm an optimist. It, it really is a very difficult balance when you are in that situation. So a lot of appraisers never sold. Here's something else. You've got appraisers now that are doing your deals coming in from out of town, like Brampton or Oakville, to do properties in Toronto. They've never lived in Toronto. They've never lived in a million or two million dollar house. They may have never owned a house. They could have grown up in an apartment, and still live in an apartment, and they're doing your appraisals. Oh my God, that drives me crazy. Major considerations: urgency, Mr. and Mrs. Price, how fast do you have to sell? Days on the market. I believe in this so strong. I go historic. I go into the archives. I want to see how many times the comparable was on the market. Um, and what sells the quickest? High end, low end, what? Sale price to days on market. I want the motivation factor. I look at all this. And realtors and appraisers, <coughs> we don't make the market. The market speaks. There it is right there. The market speaks. That is on all my literature. It sits on the table in front of me. What do expireds tell us? Exactly. Rejected. The public rejected these. Why should your house be worth more than these? Okay. What's the value of a basics evaluation? Well, let's look at this. Here is the only way that makes sense. Here's the meat and potatoes of what I want to teach you and where the takeaway is today. If I am trying to hit this target right here, the first time I draw back an arrow, I'm going to go too high. Maybe I'll go too low. But to hit the center, the target itself, first of all, we have to look at this concept that, um, whatchamacallit, that market value, there is no such thing as a market value. We have to look at the premise that there's a market value range. 
Because if I look at different people that are on this call, one of you wants to buy, let's look at the, a, a typical house. One of you wants to close in 30 days. One of you wants to close in three months. One of you fell in love with the decor and wants the, the furniture as negotiating the furniture. One of you needs some help and maybe a vendor take back mortgage. Uh, there's so many variables of what goes into a deal that the range is there. There's no such thing as a perfect price. When appraisal theory was taught, houses were ten and $15,000, folks. You can be out by $500. This, those days are gone. So today we look at hitting a target with bracketing. By the bracketing process, what I want you to take away, the takeaway today is bracketing. And I learned this early in my appraisal career because when houses were still forty, fifty thousand dollars, we had million dollar estates, and the adjustment process was impossible. And I was taught this by somebody at one of the um, large, large luxury um, uh, realtor firms that you can't adjust for these. You have to bracket these, and that made so much sense as I got into it. So let's look at bracketing. The highest price sold of a house in this range was $3,575,000. The floor of value, the lowest sold, was two seven four five. And therefore, what is it worth? Well, you don't just add the two of them up and automatically say, well, about 3.1 average or whatever it is. I, those of you that are better mathematicians than me can do arithmetic faster in your head. Maybe I'm off by a bit. But you don't just average. It could come out to that. The trouble is I need a larger sampling. I need more than just these sales. The question becomes, what do I adjust? I take a look at this one for 3575. There was a, it's out in the, in, in the um, let's say it's in Caledon area. There's a horse ring. There's, there's, there's some outbuildings. It had a pool that belonged in the Olympics. And the one that sold, um, that at 2745 is more basic and everything else. So it was a, I have to say, therefore, mine is worth more than 2745, but it's, and it's, it's not that much more, but it's worth a lot less than 3575. Do you see where I'm going? It's a honing process. It's a bracketing. I've got the high, I've got the low. Now I'm digging to find more comparables to hone it in and, bra and bracket. How do you do it? Start with how many true comparables are on MLS right now. And some of you in the, some neighborhoods, there may be one listing. You collect the best saleable comps and you may have to go out, you have to look at expireds for sure. You may for sales go back last six months. Uh, having worked all over Ontario and other places, Sometimes six months in some towns is a, it's hard to do. Some sales are like a year or two, but we, you do what you can. Here's bracketing. The highest sold for 3575, the lowest <clears throat> 2745. You never average. I know that I've got three sales that are better now than 2745. And my subject is closer to that. And I've got some sales around the three, four, three, three that are better than mine. Do you see where I'm going? I'm narrowing it, narrowing it, narrowing it. I'm bracketing it. And those are the brackets. Now, averages. Look at this picture. It's not, you can't see everybody. There's great grandfather in his 80s. On his lap is a six month old child. Over here is great is the grandfather, this man's son, who's in his 50s. And over here is that man's son. So grandfather, great grandfather, grandfather, grandson, who's in his 30s, and grand great grandson in his six months old. Tell me what the average age is. Does it matter? Because it's not applicable. It's not applicable. You can't average in real estate. Now, if I'm in a high-rise apartment building complex with a lot of turnover in a lower-end building, 
you know, I can do a, I can do a computer run on that one. I can put in an Excel spreadsheet, tell you how much a price per square foot and average it. That you can do. I'm not arguing that. And again, you have to adjust for renovations or that. That you can do. But the sampling has to be large enough. You can't just take a few things and say, that's it. Because look, come back always to this image, great grandfather to great grandson, and it just doesn't work. Bracketing. You find the high and the low. Lows are not usually your problem. It's the higher end that is. Always include expired listings where you can, if you can find them, because that becomes the absolute highest that rejects value. Always include competing listings you, and, and set yourself up so you don't have disappointment. You are not going to find a smoking gun that, quote, perfect comparable. It's not there. You may have to learn in expensive homes or custom homes or infill. You're going to have to learn something about costing. The lots were so much. The houses were so much. There's an old rule of thumb. The lots were 50% of the whole. The house is worth the other 50%. But in today, I'm finding sometimes the lot, some houses are so grand, it's the lots worth 40% and the houses worth 60. In others, it's reversed. The house is um, not as nice and the lots worth a lot more. In some cases, the house has no value at all. And we do that with land value as well. So here's what I do with my data. Mr. and Mrs. Price. Uh, this is actually from my own listing presentation, okay? I've shown you that re rejected listings were 3.25 to 4.2. Your house won't sell in that range. Historic or sold were 2.355 to 2850. But I'll give you this, in the last six months, prices have risen 4%, 10%, 12%, whatever you want. Prices have risen, and therefore I have to adjust that, which I did. Current competing listings are 2275 to 3.6, but the higher end of the asking price today will become the rejected listings too. So there doesn't mean they're all gonna sell. Based on absolutely everything I've shown you and what worked through this, what do you think we should ask for your house? Now, I'm going to stop here for a second. Do you actually believe anybody in ever has told me exactly what they think they're going to, they, they think looking at the data, what? Here's what I love when I got a couple. I've got the two guys, the husband and wife, the two ladies, whoever. I love when a couple's sitting there and I ask them that question, what should I ask? And they look at me and they look at each other. And the first reaction is, wow, that's not what I we were thinking. And I go, then it's cards on the table time. What were you thinking? Then we can start talking. Now, where am I going with? Are you going to use this and come up with, you're going to say to yourself, I know what you're thinking all the way through, but Barry, we set the price now and people are coming to $300,000 over asking price. And my whole purpose of doing this this morning is very simple. You have to set a MLS listing price that is reasonable and will attract offers and action. If you overprice a listing, any fool can underprice. And if it's underpriced, it also means, I've, I've got a buyers right now who go, these people are playing, I'm not gonna play the game, I'm not gonna be number 31 in a multiple. On the other hand, if they um, overprice, you're not gonna get multiple offers. So the fine line is to take the listing to brackets, to use bracketing, to get it to be a saleable, attractive listing. What it's going to sell for is up to you and the marketing and everything else. But you start with how you price the house to list it. Does that make sense? And for those that came a few minutes late to this, no chats. I will be opening it up unmuting and letting everybody have questions. I got away, there's the old fashioned, what we're taught in school, um, how to do things. You go superior, inferior, 
but you put 5%, 10%, 100,000, 5,000. You go, I go to court um, in the old days when I was going to court as an appraiser and the other appraisers were coming in and using these adjustments, they were getting killed in court because the first thing the lawyers would say to them is, you used a, a, a $5,000, a $10,000 adjustment. Where did you extract it from? Where's your proof? Where's your proof? All I ever do is go superior, inferior. I only have three things, similar, superior, or inferior. I don't do this 5%, 10% crap. It doesn't work anymore. So the last thing I want to say about this before we wrap this up is time adjustments. You're looking at, you have to look at the markets. Do not use MLS statistics for time adjustments. It's a mistake. It's a huge mistake. For those of you that are in Toronto, only use the statistics for, if you're going to use TREB statistics, only use the stats for the neighborhood that you're in. Do not use Toronto. How can, again, I come back to the averages. If you, you're, you're, you're averaging in mansions and shacks all in the same pot, it doesn't apply. I don't look at these. Every month, my office sends me out market stats, and every month I delete them immediately. All I care about is how many sales, but the prices, I don't look at that. I look at the neighborhood. What I do is I go in and let's say I'm, I'm talking Willowdale, which I'm, I'm used to Willowdale. I'll go into Willowdale. I'll find sales from a year ago and see if they're on the market now. And I see the adjustment. Oh, it's 10% more. They're even asking 10% more. They're asking 7% more. I find actual sales time adjust them and I know where I'm going and I may project it to go up. I have, um, I have an estate right now that I'm working on and um, a few months ago, I gave them a price. Um, I'm now ready to put it on the market. I have bumped the price, the asking price because I've been monitoring the market in the particular Parkdale area. And what I'm doing is I bumped it and the guy said to me, that's not the price we agreed on. You've come up, I go, the market's gone up. So I'm watching time at all times, okay? So what is the takeaway for today? The takeaway is brackets, brackets, and brackets. So here's something I put in. Some of you have taken other seminars with me. You know what I'm, I've, I've done this before. This is a very nice lady. She's extremely well-groomed. Look at her and compare her to a realtor. She gets up at a certain time every day. She goes, she gets to her work. She's dressed professionally. She sits down at her office, which is the cockpit of this airplane. She knows she's going from Toronto to Montreal. She does not need a map. She's done it a thousand times, but she follows and puts in a flight plan. She checks, double checks, quadruple checks, which is our diaries and everything. She knows that and those of you that fly, um, have ever flown an airplane, not as a passenger, but flown an airplane, you know the winds come up, conditions change, you have to deviate. And sometimes during our day, we have to deviate. She gets to Montreal, and by the way, before she takes off, she goes, check, 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 check. What do we do? We get out of bed at some hour, we roll out, we grumble around, we play in the computer, we do. The top realtors are this lady. We are, um, you get up, you're, you're diarized, you're on track, you do everything the right way every day. We don't wing it. Um, this is my begging. Um, I have um, some of you for your boards or your brokerages. Um, I'm doing seminars for the boards now through Zoom. I've um, got seven original seminars. They run 60 to 90 minutes and the ratings have been high. Anybody wants, all they have to do is reach out to me and I'll send you a package that I have. I just sent one to LePage office yesterday, we're LePage. Um, and to one of the boards, um, and I'll send you with all the details of what the, each one of the seminars are. My latest one, Don't Get Sued, is really doing very, very well. Now, last but not least, here's all my contact information. And with that, I am going now to unmute, unmute all. Okay, and mute, unmute. Okay, and done.
thank you very much for coming this morning. I hope I gave you some insight. My, my task here is to get you to get a properly priced listing. Where it will sell, I can't guarantee. But where you can list it for and attract those offers, that I will give you. Everybody ready? Anybody have any questions now? Um, I'm going to open the floor and thank you so much. And uh, thank you for your time. Hey, Barry, I got a question. It's Oliver. Hey, buddy. How's it going? I'm <laughs> doing well. That's good. I um, slept last night. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah, it's a rare like, event. Like, like how many hours did you sleep last night? Six. That's, that's, yeah, that's good. That's good. For me, that's double. For you, that's double. Oh, wow. Well, that's good. Uh, question for you. Um, you mentioned about the opinion of value. Yep. And, and how uh, we are not covered under errors, errors and emissions insurance. Um, I had one of my agents come to me with that, and I kind of mentioned that exactly to them. Uh, they had put a clause in the opinion of value that they will not, like this is just an opinion of value, and they will not be, they, they, they are not going to be going to any court or anything of that can't, nature. Can't do it. Can't do it. Can't do it. Can't do it. So that, that's what I wanted to confirm. You can't do it, eh? No, because you can't absurd uh, the uh, power of the court. The court would take one look and say, how dare you? The court can bring in any document. Any you document. Can, you can't be, the, name on. you can't negate that. And there's, let, please understand anybody listening, there is no such thing in, the, in Canada as an opinion of value. That stopped 20 years ago. You yeah. open your mouth and say $300,000, you just gave an appraisal. The yeah. courts deem you are a professional and every valuation is a an appraisal and there's these opinions don't there should never be something saying an opinion of value it is an appraisal i put down um a valuation estimate or stuff like that but i will not use um opinion of value when i'm doing a simple letter for a lawyer sometimes i will put down a valuation um estimate or something to that effect and i right. never put a figure in either i put a range of value so if you're looking at a million dollar house, I'll say the range appears to be from 950 to a million fifty. The midpoint is one million dollars. The um, estimated estimated value, therefore, is approximately one million dollars. Yeah. Okay. Don't ever say opinion of value. Perfect. Thanks, Barry. Thank you. Next, I got. I don't want chats, folks. Ask questions. Unmute yourself and ask. I see people asking on chat. Just unmute yourself. Uh, Barry, I, it's April uh, Estevez. Hi, Hi, I have a question. You were talking about comparing, looking at recent sales, but looking more importantly at current prices. And what we're finding in Toronto now, for example, there was two recent sales in the Roncesvalles uh, area, semis that ended up selling in the range of 600,000 higher than the list price. How would you um, handle this? Because you're obviously looking at a property that was listed at 1213, selling for over 2 million and uh, for the other 1.8 almost. I, I, as a matter of fact, I, I'm doing, I just did it. I saw that by the way, because um, I've got a listing coming out um, in Parkdale, so. Um, and I was doing the analysis uh, late yesterday, so I've seen some crazy prices. I first of all, they were they appear to be underpriced, and the right. other thing is too. That's the first thing they were underpriced. Number two, you can't measure what's in people's minds or the frenzy. Let's go back to the slide of the lemons going um, the, over the um, the cliff. People are acting really not very bright right now. They're just jumping. And um, let, me, let me say this to you, it's impossible to see what someone's going to leap over everybody and pay to get that property. It's impossible, but it was underpriced to start with because a basic, you know as well as I do, a complete gut house in that area, gutted, in horrible condition, starts about a million one, a million two. Mm -hmm. It was under, they were underpriced to start with. And that's what I'm trying to get away from in, the, in what I did this morning. They should have priced it better and uh, more realistically. And then there wouldn't have been 600. The agents got bragging rights now. Mm -hmm. I don't know if the agents do it on purpose to get the bragging rights or the agents just don't know how to price it. 
and I just try to attract the bidding more. I don't know. All I know is some of my buyers right now are saying when they see an underpriced listing, they're knowing they're going to be offered 31 and they don't want in. They told me we're not in. Mm -hmm. Who else? Who else? Anyone else before we, anyone want to unmute yourself? Any questions? Yeah, hi there, Barry. It's uh, Annette Hamrick here out of Niagara. Uh, we have that uh, happening here uh, pretty much every um, piece of property uh, at a certain price here is underpriced, completely overpriced. And I know you have your prices in, uh, in Toronto, but we have here properties going $150,000, $200,000 over asking in Niagara, which is just absolutely insane. No. And uh, competition, like on Monday, I was in competition with 49 other realtors. So it is no fun whatsoever for the buyers. Uh, and as you said, that, that, that uh, picture of uh, the crowd jumping off the cliff, it's a very good one because that's pretty much what's happening. And um, anyhow, uh, it's just like, what, what are you going to do? Because you know they're underpriced. And, uh, and, and, Toron and Toronto's it, part of the frenzy. Because mm -hmm. there, you, where's your buyer? Where are your buyers coming from? A lot of these. Oh, so actually, we have a combination. We have now at the moment a lot of buyers coming out of the GTA because everybody now wants to live in the country, or not every, but not everybody. No, but smaller, <laughs> town, smaller town, whatever they want to get out of the the, the larger urban areas. So uh, they are coming down to St. Catharines, Font Hill. Uh, you name it, you know, so uh, anyhow, so we have that here happening too. And uh, it's just insanity. I, I, I was on the phone with someone from your area recently, just over this conversation. Remember something. Um, most of most people drive to where they can afford. Mm -hmm. They can't live in Toronto because they can't afford it. So they keep driving until they can get to the area where all of a sudden, hey, there's my two thousand dollars a month payments. That's it. That's where. That's my. That's where my elastic band takes me to. Mm -hmm. You know, um, they drive to where they can afford. It's just that simple. I mean, the same. The same conversations going on right now in Peterborough and Guelph and uh, Windsor. I mean, um, no offense in Niagara Falls. I worked very extensively in Niagara Falls in my career as an appraiser, and um, it was pretty sleepy for an awful long time. Long time, not anymore. Mm -hmm. and, you know, the next thing I heard is now somebody told me Welland. Welland to me was where old people went to become elderly people, mm -hmm. and that's changed from too. Very. Much somebody tells me Fort Erie's taking off, then I know there's no value to money. Yeah, Fort Erie's probably my least favorite place in Ontario even outside Fort of Erie Cornwall. Is, is, even Fort Erie has 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 that happening as well. Uh, um, and of course, after this, with this whole COVID, we also have a lot of people, of course, can work from home now. So if you have to go into Oakville or to Burlington or to Toronto, maybe once a week, then it's not so bad. Especially with the GO train. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I know, I know. Okay, Anyhow. thank you. Thank You're you. Up. Anybody else before we say goodbye this morning? Any other questions? Just unmute yourself and go ahead, please. I'll wait for one more, two more, and then we can say goodbye this morning, go back and slay our dragons. No one? Barry, it's Betty Ann here. Hi. Nothing to do with appraisals. When do you think the market's gonna shift? I couldn't believe it's gone this far, but you gotta understand it's my fault. This whole market's my fault. <laughs> and the reason that it's my fault is I'm a baby boomer. And who owns the largest percentage of single family dwellings in all of Canada? baby boomers and baby boomers aren't moving. Um, I lost my entire business last year when COVID hit because I had nothing but boomers ready to um, sell. And then COVID hit, and all of a sudden, all, none of my people wanted the list. They're all here. All of us in the seniors field that are working with seniors that have been moving down. We had, I, I had one last year, one person that was normalized. All my senior moves last year were either somebody died or was on the brink of death and had to move. I had a good year, but it, it wasn't traditional. And um, it's the boomer's fault for not. Once you got, COVID's going to be a real factor until we get the vaccines, until society opens up and product comes out. Now, here's, here's a prediction. 
we're not going to see most of Canada vaccinated until the weather is cold again in 2021. And when the weather gets cold again, boomers aren't going to move still because it's winter. You're not going to see a lot of activity in 2022. It was spring. I hate to say it. Yes, ma'am. Do you think part of that, I'm in the same boat, so I work with a lot of retirees. They're my favorite demographic. Um, but in the last year, I've really noticed that they're not shifting. Actually, two years. I'm in London. Uh, oh. The biggest challenge that we're seeing is that they used to be able to take their four-bedroom huge house, sell it for 600 back in the day, uh, but now they can't shift down you know, sell at 600, buy at 350 and have the cash to live on. Yeah. What's happening is those retirees are, you know, they're looking to, so their house values have gone up. So it's no longer 600, but it might be 750. But in order to replace that, they're looking at 750 or 800,000 to, to downsize. So that's the struggle that I'm finding now. And I've got clients that are no longer in a position where they have a choice. And that's, for me, it's, I could just cry for them. I put in a lot of seniors, I put an extremely wealthy senior sold a $2 million condo and put her into a rental and the money's in the bank. Yeah. She says had... she's happier than she's ever been happy. All of a sudden she's got no pressure, none. And I've done, I've done a lot of that. By the way, I don't wanna get into this. Hannah, I'm reaching out to you to do something. Um, connect with me after this. I started a special group. We're going to all work with seniors and everything, and we're going to be sharing all kinds of stuff internally, about six of us, seven of us, including um, a lady out of uh, um, the United States that's been working with seniors for 20, 25 years. So if you want to be part of it, just reach out and I'll put you into a mastermind. Okay, thank you so much. Just reach out to me when this is over. Anybody else? I can only allow so many per city. You know what I mean? Barry, I'd like to be in that from Ottawa. I'm I'm a SRES too. Okay, all right. You can just do the same thing. Reach out to me when this is over. Um, anybody else have an appraisal question, and then we're going to say goodbye. Thank anybody you. else? Thank you so much, Barry. Nice Again. to see you, Denise. Nice, nice to see, see you, Barry. Barry. <laughs> You're yeah, one of the last so people much. I had dinner with. <laughs> well, I'm special, I guess. Yes, no. I am. It, COVID, you. COVID, COVID took, you know, I would go out in the course of a year, I'd probably have a hundred dinners with realtors and people in the business. And all of a sudden it's like, I can count on my fingers the last three people I went <laughs> for dinner at the, in 2000. And, you know, it was, it, it's crazy, crazy. Oh, anyways, but you know, folks, you asked me another question about the market. The market is all predicated on, um, nobody's buying houses, folks. Remember that. And please understand where I'm coming from. It's facetious remark. People are buying, they're not buying. They're renting the cheapest money in history. It's all about interest rates. Yeah. If interest rates were higher, this wouldn't be happening. And, um, but I'll also say to those of you that are younger and haven't been around, the economists screw up because in the worst time in history of modern history, um, in 1981, there was 13% unemployment. Thank you, Mr. Trudeau Sr. The bankruptcies were unbelievable. Interest rates hit 21.3 quarter percent. You walked into the TD Bank or Royal Bank and got 21 and three quarters. And you know what? Thousands of homes sold every month because the economists forget the desire to own a home is greater than the reality of the economics facing us. Right now they're giving away cheap money. I am wondering what's going to happen in four to five years when the mortgage is mature. I, I don't know. Everything, I read the Federal Reserve stats coming out and all their projections in the United States, interest rates aren't going up. Half a percent maybe or something, but they're not going up. We, we could also be looking at hyperinflation. You gotta look at that as a, as a problem too, so. But I'm not an economist. I'm just a simple real estate agent that just wants to get my share of the market, period. That's all. Mm -hmm. So who can do a predi prediction? Okay, is everybody good? Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Barry. Thank you for Thank your you, time. Barry. And uh, it, this will be on Barry Lebo TV on 
uh, YouTube, when we can figure out how to get back into Barry <laughs> we, 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 you Google's driving me crazy right now. Thanks and goodbye. And uh, whatever you do today, do it well. Take care. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Take care. Bye.